Good afternoon, everybody, and this is Richard Olberger, PhD, clinical and performance psychologist, and this is the Richard Listen Show. Thank you for being present with us today, hopefully on this uh, wintry Veterans Day recording. Uh, we are committed to bringing you peak performance from a variety of realms and sharing their gifts, strengths, and the ways in which they share their talents with the world. Uh, most of you are familiar. I've been working on uh, training in EMDR, so I'm privileged today to have my actual trainer uh, present here and looking at the applications of EMDR for trauma, uh, addiction, as well as uh, for my field of interest in sports psychology and peak performance. Uh, without further ado, today's guest is... Larissa Traga. She is a licensed clinical social worker, a master's of addiction counseling. Uh, she's going to explain to us what CCDS stands for. Uh, she is also a Mint member, which is for motivational interviewing, and she's also MDRIA, which is the EMDR International Association uh, EMDR certified therapist, and I had a privilege of attending there conference this year so we'll get to talk a little bit about that um without further ado welcome larissa traga thank you it's, thank a, you. it's a privilege to be here thank you straight from a plane i love it we're, we're we're in demand now people come straight from the airport uh to our studio uh so you know clients want to know i mean everyone wants to know about emdr what is it you know um debunking the myths and, and how far it's come in the 30 years or so that it's become from what's on the licensing exam is probably the um, uh, most efficacious method of treating uh, trauma. Uh, see if it's still up there in, in your opinion and uh, your experience now with being able to provide this type of training, not only offering this therapy, but offering it to people of low income and uh, even providing going out and accessing therapists who probably wouldn't otherwise be able to access the training. So um, without further ado, please uh, tell us, Ms. Laura Sotraga, what has brought you to this path? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I would say that this has been a path in the making for many, many years. Um, I know that I had heard about EMDR back in the 90s when I was in grad school and I thought hmm, this is interesting but at that time it was taboo and not something that um, you could really explore too much in the school setting um, my undergrad you had, to, you had to like find Francine Shapiro and go to her house I mean what was it yeah I remember hearing about it finding it like very yeah, yeah. It was just very sh like shunned upon. And my undergrad, which was SUNY Binghamton, was very much CBT based. And that was all I learned in undergraduate school. Um, had heard about it also again in um, grad school at University of Michigan, but really didn't delve into it until um, went to a conference. It was a Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference in California when we moved out here, and I heard Bessel van der Kolk um, speak about trauma and different approaches and comparing EMDR to other approaches, and uh, that's that's when I was like, all right, I really need to get um, I really need to get trained in EMDR because it's been kind of on my radar for a long time. And just just for our listeners to know, um, Bessel van der Kolk's book, uh, "The Body Keeps Score," is probably like the Bible for a lot of work, you know, that goes into the different uh, trauma psychotherapies today and understanding uh, how trauma gets stored in the body. And the Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference is it annual or every two years? No, I think it's about every four or five. Four or years. five years, but yeah. it it brings in uh, heavy hit hitters in the field of uh, psychology. And so if you're really looking to expand, get out of your burnout, uh, learn more about people who have pioneered the field, um, and you want to go to Disneyland, perhaps. Absolutely. <laughs> it's usually in Anaheim. Absolutely. Uh, so so uh, both you know worthwhile. It sounds like it was that for you. It, it kind of sets your, your mind into like, whoa, what's out there? Who's doing what? Yes, to absolutely. When I heard him speak, and actually at that conference, I got to meet Francine Shapiro too, um, among other, 
you know, just um, role models and big names in in our field. And, um, and she she pretty much pioneered the field, uh, study of EMDR in her own graduate work. Or when did she she started it? Um, no, I think it was before she went back to school and um yeah it's, you know the story goes is that she was walking in the park and um was dealing with some of her own stuff i believe you know treatment for cancer and the like and started using eye movements to help herself feel better and then for, it kind of evolved from there um and so when the opportunity came up for me to get trained uh in my area i live in santa maria california I uh, totally jumped on it. I was like, oh, I definitely want to do this. And um, it was uh, brought to our area by Roy Kiesling, who uh, at that time was starting his own, doing his own trainings and really is a humanitarian and believes in bringing EMDR to the nonprofit sector, bringing it to, you know, uh, clinicians in uh, smaller towns and cities so that um, there's access to learning the modality and then being able to use it. And uh, was, I, that, was that the part that, that really inspired you, that it was humanitarian, that his desire was not just to teach the modality, but what he wanted to do with it and who he wanted to reach? Yeah, you know, um, at that time I had no idea like who he was or anything. I just knew there was a training and I wanted to get trained in EMDR. And then when I met him, I realized um, how much I uh, appreciated his mission, which is to spread EMDR across the world, really. And he had done a lot of work, um, you know, volunteering his time to uh, bring EMDR and to... Um, provide solace to a lot of people worldwide and so I um, said I I want to do what you do and by then I had already been doing trainings for the county of Santa Barbara in uh, motivational interviewing and some other modalities and um, it just kind of uh, you know flew from there and it was uh, very rewarding to be able to work with him and be mentored and and grow as a clinician. So you went straight from getting trained in EMDR to, to becoming a trainer. Yeah, so what I did is I got trained and then I worked towards the certification right away, which is a process that takes a couple of years or so. And then as soon as I became certified, um, I started coaching with Roy Kiesling. And, um, and then about two years ago, I got my approved consultant status with Emdria, and so uh, I'm now able to offer trainings and and help others become um, certified, such as yourself. Yes, so, thank you. Yes, yeah. Yeah. many many hats. So, what's that like, though? I mean, I know from personal experience, this world of like being in practice and then putting yourself out there in such a capacity for so many. Um, how do you maintain that kind of accordion ability to expand yourself and yet still maintain self-care yeah yeah that's a good question i would say that um for me it it kind of evolved naturally because i've always enjoyed doing different things and not just one thing um which was a benefit in you know kind of working at a county level where you're always doing something different um and um and so it just kind of evolved in a way where I knew I wanted to do that. And I, I knew that um, I was so passionate about it because it really helped me as a clinician. I was able to reduce my burnout. I was able to see better results with clients. Um, clients were getting better. My colleagues were getting more and more curious about EMDR. And um, I think just kind of my personality is, is such that I like to share what I know. I always have, uh, which is, I think, how I kind of got into training because that was not my intention when I went to grad school uh, for social work. Totally just wanted to work with clients. Um, and then I realized that I have a passion for teaching too and sharing what I know. And um, in terms of self-care, I would say that it, it actually is part of my self-care. And what I know about myself is that being full-time in private practice would be difficult for me. 
and being able to share and inspire others to learn modalities like motivational interviewing and EMDR, both of which I would say would, you know, have saved my career as a social worker in terms of, you know, burnout and being able to manage and cope. And So you get a chance to pay it forward to your fellow clinician and keep them out of the danger zones. Absolutely. And also give yourself a chance to diversify and experience a variety of things. Absolutely. So for the layman out there who doesn't have any idea, like when they keep asking, what is EMDR? And I know they can YouTube a, a few basic, um, uh, was there's kind of some graphic ones that show. Uh, animations. Animations, right. Thank yes. you. What can, what can you explain to them about the general principles and how it's applicable to helping clients in a different way? Yeah. So general principles of EMDR are that um, it's a modality that um, has been shown to be very effective with treating uh, individuals with trauma. That's kind of how it developed. And um, the way that it works or in terms of the assumption is that, you know, as humans, we're programmed to heal um, and program for survival. So our brain and our body is going to do whatever it needs in order to survive. And when we experience um, adverse experiences, whether as an adult or as a child, these different experiences have an impact on us. And um, because they're not able to um, kind of, they're not able to um, get processed in, a normal way that we typically process our day, like at night when we sleep and we, we go into the REM sleep cycles. And so uh, what EMDR does is in a safe environment after we go through some preparation and resourcing and helping a person with stabilization and affect uh, regulation to help them kind of uh, open uh, some of that up and uh, reprocess, you know, images, um, uh, sounds, sensations, feelings, and um, beliefs that they have about themselves as a result of those experiences. And then, you know, the analogy I like to use is just kind of freeing yourself from some of those experiences so that you can be the best self that you were meant to be. Yeah, and that's, and that's the key, right? That people aren't aware how they s internalize or store beliefs about themselves based on their experiences. And, and they may have crafted a lot of negative beliefs uh, to explain why they had to go through survival in this way. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, kind of form different beliefs uh, based on our experiences. And the more we experience similar things, um, let's say, you know, receiving messages of not being enough or worthless growing up and then kind of... Um, that becoming the lens through which, you know, they see the world and themselves and therefore it's going to impact and interfere with their ability uh, to, to be good enough, to feel good enough, to feel worthwhile, regardless of what they might have been through in their lives. Yeah, I was reading something even about uh, kind of confidence and false confidence, the kids who are from, you know, maybe affluent areas who get treated a certain way, they start to believe that they're worth it or good enough. And even though they may have done nothing to earn it, like in a way that confidence can carry them forward. Like when they go out into the world that they, they um, just based on, they drew or attracted a certain kind of treatment. Um, and whereas um, people who go in from minorities into certain schools with the imposter effect, like I don't belong here. Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of them can drop out. Uh, like they're looking for that first time when they're identified as being different uh, or, you know, not as not as good as or, or not belonging, even though they could be the top of the class. Uh, so it's like this reconditioning that's um, true. That's that, right. that has to happen. Yeah. Um, so I guess the applications for for sports can be, you know, people who start to believe uh, the if they failed once that they're a failure or that they're not good enough anymore. That's right. Or, or maybe they had an injury and the injury, you know, affected how they feel about themselves. And then that might interfere, you know, with their ability to 
um, to be the best self that they can be or that maybe they have been able to be. And so um, EMDR can can help kind of uh, reprocess some of those experiences and let them, you know, um, kind of work through that. I know for me, uh, I know, you know, you probably heard the story at the trainings that we'll share it for our listeners. Yeah, yeah. So for me, um, you know, I grew up playing the violin and um, really loved the instrument, but the public performances where I was uh, being evaluated was very difficult um, as a nine-year-old. And there was a lot of that um, not recitals. good enough. Yes, oh. recitals. And a lot of the, you know, the kind of the belief that I had about myself was not good enough. And, um, and that was a big... A big hurdle that I had to overcome in order to do what I do now. Um, public performance was one of the, you know, the most anxiety-provoking things for me to, or hurdles for me to overcome in order to be able to do what I do now. And so, EMDR have helped me in that process for sure. So, so was it? Um, did something happen in an early performance? To yeah. So just um, you know. I, I used to have to perform in front of a um, a few rows of teachers um, every six months or so growing up when I was playing the violin. So you can imagine for an eight, nine-year-old. A lot of evaluation how, going yes, on. Yes, <laughs> yes. And with the violin, the thing about it is, you know, you make a mistake, everyone hears it. Right. Um, you know, my kids play the piano and, you know, I, I remember when I would go to their recitals, I would tell them, you make a mistake, just keep going. Nobody will notice with a piano. You could do that with violin. You can't. And so I remember every time I made a mistake, it was just such a damper on my, you know, um, on my ability to continue. And and that kind of evolved into this uh you know, I'm not good enough, and definitely the imposter syndrome and all of that. So, yeah, I had to do a lot of work to to overcome all that. Cause so did, did your parents get you help? Like, how did you overcome it? No, uh, I uh, got help myself. And, and honestly, you know, when I started doing trainings back in 2011, it was very hard for me very hard. I started very small, six to eight people, having a co-trainer, and uh, slowly, slowly, with the help of EMDR and, you know, uh, just putting myself out there because I knew that I really enjoyed doing it and I didn't want my fears to interfere. Well, they say it's one of the top five, right, fears, right, next to, like, That's death right. is public That's speaking. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, right, you know, instantaneously having to fight off thoughts of what every single person is thinking and am I good enough? Am I doing a good job? And it's like a bombardment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the more I did it, though, the more I, I was reinforced that I can do this. I can do this. And um, the feedback, of course, was helpful, too. And uh, that's kind of how I got to where I am now. <laughs> yeah. So um, did they, did the trainee, because they're working in the same field, did they help with those kind of negative beliefs that come up? I mean, I know for me doing the podcast, I was like sweating profusely. I was like wanting to stick my head out like two to five minutes a show, you know, and then go back and hide. Uh, and then I'd get feedback afterwards. Like, you know, you need to you need to speak more, mm. you need to share more. <laughs> I was deferring, which which is probably a survival skill, right? Yes. Which is really helpful and great for being a therapist at times. Yes. And yet in in the work of EMDR or you know even the somatic experience work interrupting is is crucial right being able to break patterns uh that are not helpful absolutely um, yeah yeah so so how did you uh incorporate uh your co-trainer and and working on your own resistance to being evaluated how how did you keep pushing through that um, yeah, I would say that I remember when I first started doing it, I would say, okay, so I would have my co-trainer start first, um, 
because somehow I felt better if I went second and not first. <laughs> so I remember going <laughs> through that. Let them take the, yes. you get the evil looks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, um, and then slowly as I uh, became more and more comfortable with myself and comfortable with the material, um, I think that I, and the feedback, of course, which was, you know, you don't look nervous at all. And really, you have anxiety about this? And that kind of feedback was uh, definitely reinforcing that, hey, you know, I can do this no matter how it might feel inside, you know, uh, initially. And that's and that's a parallel for a lot of even professionals in, in sporting domains, right? People think they looked calm yes. and they don't realize that that pitcher on the mound in the major leagues is experiencing anxiety Absolutely. and stress or that batter, right? Absolutely. And they may be needing to do certain skills or performance practices to help them yes. focus. Absolutely. And stay with their performance plan. And yeah. not get triggered by whatever's happening or distractions. Absolutely. So yeah. how do you um, manage distractions? You mean like at a tr at training? Or? Yeah, I mean, right. That's really hard, right? Because you have this big task. Yes. I mean, uh, and remind everyone just so they know, how many people have, uh, have you trained uh, um, or are being trained right now? Yeah. So, in the MDR? So um, I've done... I've done a, a bunch of trainings. I would say the biggest training I've done has been about um, 65 people. And that was a motivational interviewing training that I did um, when I worked at the county. Uh, and then in terms of my EMDR trainings, probably the largest has been about um, 35, 37, somewhere there. Yeah. And, um, you know, how do I manage distractions? I would say, um, I, you know, I have kind of my, I'm a pretty structured person. So I, I have my kind of, uh, agenda of where I'm trying to go with them. What, what I feel, um, I really want to make sure that they get out of the, you know, their experience at the training. And then at the same time, finding that balance of being flexible and being able to get to people's, you know, different questions and concerns and their own process of change and ambivalence around EMDR. And is this really going to be the thing that's going to, you know, help me and also help my clients at the same time, right? So, and, um, and so I would say that uh, a combination of motivational interviewing to kind of roll with some of the resistance that might pop up or show up in a training setting around really like you just wave your hand in front of somebody's, uh, you know, face and they start feeling better uh, and, and just kind of trusting the process. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I always think in, in putting myself in, in your shoes, obviously, as, as somebody who um, would like to teach others and train others in different capacities, whether it be in EMDR or in sports psychology going forward, is the management of, of group dynamics of, you know, even clinicians or professionals that are bringing their own issues, their own demands um, and how you manage that and keep focus for the rest of the group. Um, cause you have to consider the person who's speaking the least as much as you do the one who's speaking the most. Um, what, you know, what tips do you have, uh, for that? I mean, yeah. for, right. Cause we don't want to alienate anybody. There is a group going on and, and no question is a bad question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that, um, the style in which I, um, kind of the, the stage that I set for any training that I do is from that style of, you know, um, strength based and very much, um, you know, looking to the participants to teach me as I'm also teaching them and uh, being open to the different perspectives in the room and the different expertise in the room, you know, because when I first started out doing trainings, it was um, more just, uh, you know, staff um, licensed or unlicensed, you know, uh, at any level of education. And more and more as I get into training in EMDR, I'm, I'm working with some really 
wise and experienced uh, clinicians and psychologists and you know social workers who have uh, a lot of expertise that they bring into the room. And I think that the combination of their expertise and mine really creates for a very rich experience for everybody. Everybody yeah, that's, that's a really valid perspective, you know, this model of like, there's an experience going on. It's not just learning. Uh, it's one of the things that's drawn me towards these approaches that are more um, somatic based or outside of the box. You know, I mean, CBT, you know, for, for its uses and applications, very rigid, very structured, um, you know, very uh, Western uh, based deferring to the, the expert and the model. Yes. Um, whereas opposed to, you know, the experience of training and going into environments and deferring to people who have expertise or techniques of relating um, that may be very unique to the population that they work with, uh, whether it be in the jail um, or, you know, yes. athletes or, or we, we met a variety of people from a variety of uh, you know, eating Long disorder time. clinics, substance abuse clinics, right? So yes. if if there's a rigidity and lack of openness to understanding their perspective, absolutely. Um, what's the likelihood that they're going to use the method or even try it? Absolutely, right. So coming at it from the perspective of you you came in as an expert and this is just another tool that you're learning that is going to help you um, when you feel like, okay, you know, I've tried so many things and nothing has worked and I'm going to try this. And, and what I find is that those, um, clinicians that get trained in, in our mo model, which is more integrative EMDR, where you integrate it into your practice, um, you know, clinicians find that, uh, they're drawing and kind of going back to EMDR more and more because of how effective it is and how quickly a person can feel, um, relief and lightness and, uh, being able to, uh, just kind of, uh, move forward with their lives rather than be stuck. Yeah. And that feels very indicative of the, the time that we're living in, um, Clinicians don't want to be pigeonholed. Uh, clients want to get what's cutting edge and works. Um, so the willingness to try what might help them uh, yes. and know that you're willing to um, flow between what you like best or what they're needing at the moment yeah. uh, is probably going to gain more trust and credibility. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, more and more as clients come in, you know, word of mouth, they refer clients, other people in their lives because they know how effective it was for them and their yeah. healing process. Well, it also sends a massive kind of in the community cultural effect that like that there's no boundary on who can access, you know, we talk about like sensitivity to, you know, being culturally diverse and the, the, you know, a lot of the feedback, I was at a California Board of Psychology meeting and desperately trying to be a part of a movement that reaches students in California and figure out how their voice or perspective um, is reached. And a lot of the feedback or criticism was like, uh, or just under-representation of, of minorities. Um, I'm not sure what the gender disparity is, but predominantly it becomes... Uh, a profession, and I know the EMDR Association has gotten similar feedback of being older, you know, white mm -hmm. professionals. Mm -hmm. And so how do you reach those that feel they're not included or have not had access to something? Yeah. Um, how do you make it more accessible and how do you kind of reshift their belief systems about a model? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question because I agree with you that it has been, you know, for so long only accept accessible to some, and um, and for me, I mean, it took years for me to get trained from when I wanted to to when I actually got trained. Part of partly because of the cost, right? The training is a pretty, it's a, it's a, it's a big investment, um, and you know, with EMDR consulting, what we do is we we make it affordable. We have payment plans, and in fact, our training is 
it's the most affordable training um, because it's quite a bit cheaper. Um, we a lot of times come to you, which is why I just got off the plane this morning because I was in in Wilsonville, uh, Oregon, doing a training. You're, you're hitting parts of the states that I've never heard of before. Yeah, Bakersfield. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, what's the city you go to in in California? The Danish town. Solving. Solving. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sideways aficionados can also learn EMDR. <laughs> yep. So I, you know, so I've been, you know, just traveling to, to the, the cities and, and towns that are smaller where um, there is no access to evidence-based uh, trainings or being able to get uh, continuing education units and and then the other thing that we do is we do offer as part of the training is 10 hours of consultation that they don't have to pay separately for which is also something that I um I strongly believe in right that in order for you to implement what you're learning to be able to have the support that you need and I do this both with motivational interviewing trainings that I host um, as well as EMDR um, that you know you get a certain amount of uh, you know f um, ability to consult on your cases and challenges that you have post the training because just getting trained is one thing but implementation is a whole different ball game and um and that's you know i would say pretty unique um to to me in terms of being able to do that with motivational interviewing and being able to come back and and support the staff in in applying the the different things that they learn in the trainings yeah so this is i mean a, a huge overtaking to bring knowledge and skills to people and this speaks to what we were kind of talking about off the air before getting on here is that for all the people who are entering into uh, professions of therapy and counseling and their worldview has not been exposed or challenged, um, that that can limit your growth as a, as a performer, so to speak, in the therapy realm. That if you want to be able to help people that you're not familiar with how they grew up, if yeah. you're in an area which is uh, ethnically diverse, culturally diverse, um, economically diverse, and you want to be able to help those that do not resemble you, mm -hmm. um, that exposure to different modes of training, uh, openness to looking at your underlying beliefs. Yeah. So you're really you know, taking on a huge uh, task to bring this to people to help yeah. open them up. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the model that... Uh, you know, we we follow that. You know, we want we want everyone to who wants to right, who wants to grow and learn to have access to to this. So, what's the the higher goal? Like, what's the what's the championship? Right? Is it to train? Is it to reduce the amount of trauma experienced in clients uh, across the country? Like, what is the the bigger vision? Yeah, yeah. For helping so many people learn. Yeah. I think, um, you know, just kind of reflecting on my own work and how much I've been able to help my clients so much more since becoming, you know, um, and getting into EMDR, I would say that that's the hope is that you can, wherever you are, whether it's inner city, whether, you know, it's a town where the only way to see a therapist is via teletherapy, right? To, to have access to this modality because of how effective it is and how healing it is and how integrative it is, right? Because a lot of what we do is body-based and, and uh, the right brain to right brain connection that we emphasize in the trainings that we do, the attachment and attunement repair, right? I mean, there's just so many layers um, to how much healing comes from, um, you know, applying some of the skills that we, that we, uh, teach in, in the trainings that we do. Yes. And, and for those of you who haven't heard of Gabor Mate and, and his book, uh, when the body says no, if you want to listen more about early attachment and how all of us and the variety of ways, even the ways, you know, uh, workaholism, you know, whatever it is that you do to get energy or get attention might be causing you to live out of balance. Um, you know, this kind of work starts not only for therapists, but just as us as individuals, how we operate in families and relationships. 
And starting to look at that stuff can have uh, a ripple effect over healing. And healing can start now and healing can start exactly where you're at. And it doesn't matter what profession uh, or line you're in. So how about for you, uh, Larissa, how have you used EMDR and MI to to help heal yourself? And and what would you advise to our listeners who are looking to to get a start on a course, taking the first step? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that um, for me, I, I was getting burned out in the field. And uh, working with severe and persistent mental illness in the county setting with, uh, you know, transitional age youth with co-occurring disorders, um, I was feeling like my toolbox was not full enough and I needed more tools, particularly with working with trauma, particularly working with working with behavior change, um, because as you know, right, uh, there's a lot of ambivalence that we experience when we're considering change. And so for me, uh, learning um, and growing with EMDR and with motivational interviewing, which was prior to EMDR, uh, the combination of those two has really been um, been so supportive in my growth as a clinician and I would say as a person because, for instance, with motivational interviewing, I remember thinking to myself, I don't just want to become an expert or learn more about MI because I want to be a better therapist. I want to do it because I want to be a better mom. I want to be a better sister. I want to be a better daughter. I want to be a better colleague, supervisor, and the different hats that I've worn over the years. And I would say that it has definitely facilitated that process for me because I understand um, you know the concepts uh, much better around ambivalence and how difficult change is and reluctance right so one of the things that I teach in my trainings is I don't like to use the word resistance you know that there's reluctance and it's a more of a of a subconscious process that occurs when we're just not sure or not convinced that uh, making the change is going to be you know um, what we need um, or even what we want and and so I would say that um, for, for me that's how it has helped me not just as a clinician but also as a as a person and therefore I'm lighter and it's easier to have conversations with me uh, because of the, you know, the counseling style of being strength based and, and centered on the individual and seeing them as the expert. And I would say that that's a huge shift, you know, in our field, right? It's been rather than looking down or being highly, highly critical. So how does, how does someone look at their re- reluctance? How does someone examine that? Yeah. Uh, inquisitively and with curiosity and, and with patience in examining change, whether you be a client or someone, you know, not sure you want to handle your addiction and yeah. gambling or substances or someone wanting to get in or out of a relationship or someone looking to train and expand their practice yeah. and get out of burnout. How, how do they begin? Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks. So I would say that um, there's a few different ways, but one one uh, intervention that I, you know, teach in the motivational interviewing trainings that I do is looking at their values and helping them connect back to what it is that they value, what it is that, um, you know, makes them who they are. And, um, and then looking at, well, where are they compared to what they value, right? So if your value is to have balance in your life, uh, and you're working 60, 70 hour weeks, there is a discrepancy, right, between where you are and where you want to be. So what you value and, and what's actually happening. And so I would say that that awareness is the first step, right? Just to become aware of uh, what do I value? What do I want for myself? And w- how close am I to that? Um, and then using the different modalities of, you know, the, uh, we call them ORs, which is uh, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening, and summaries to elicit from the individual 
um, kind of what do they want out of life? What are their desires? You know, what are their past successes? We have an acronym in MI called Darn Cats. So darn standing for, you know, eliciting their desire, their abilities, their reasons for change, their need for change. Like what's at stake if nothing changes, right? That kind of gets you thinking. And then once you kind of walk them through that. Darn cats. That's right. Then uh, working on uh, getting some commitment um, and then action taking and, and taking steps. So that's great. Yeah. Can you do that on yourself or do you need an accountable partner or do you need a therapist? Yeah. Good question. Do you need a, am I trainer? Yeah. In your yeah, life? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I think it depends, right? It's very individualized, but I know that for me, it was a combination of always to strive to, to, to do more and better in whatever I'm doing, right? And so becoming uh, more and more effective as a person, as a clinician, uh, and just as a citizen, right? And uh, tapping into whatever is available to me to do that, whether it be, you know, kind of getting on different webinars or supporting my growth through watching YouTube videos. There's a lot of stuff out there. And then uh, finally, I would say that for me, what really helped is... Um, that you know going to trainings and then working on implementing it and getting feedback so I had a mentor who helped me through that you know recording my sessions and giving me feedback where am I how am I doing and then uh, what's missing where, where do I want to go that's pretty valuable yeah I'm, I'm a personal fan of uh, you know having an accountability buddy and whatever change you want to make whether it be coming off injury and needing just to to walk around the block yeah. Um, or, um, you know, making some bigger change and trying to figure out how to grow your practice if you're in the therapy field, uh, and, and get together with someone for lunch and think about, you know, what, what are they training in? What are they learning? What ways are they putting themselves out there to share and add value, yeah. um, to avoid that tendency to just be locked in, uh, absorbing, um, repetitive pain. Absolutely. And that can be a big, uh, you know, trap that we fall into as therapists. Absolutely. So uh, in closing, uh, please share with us, Larissa, how can people get a hold of you? How can they learn more about um, uh, your consulting group and trainings upcoming and opportunities wherever they may be yeah. uh, in the lovely uh, state, Western states? Or are you going nationwide? Yeah. Um, currently, I'm just in the Western states, but I am open to going nationwide. Just uh, depends on when and all that. I would say that um, the best way to kind of explore more about uh, either one in terms of EMDR or motivational interviewing is to visit my website, which is Empower TCT, which, which stands for training, consulting and therapy dot com. So Empower TCT dot com and I'm also on Instagram and Facebook um, and LinkedIn, uh, and my contact information is all there. And I just want to say that um, this has been a, a really fun journey for me, and I'm really looking forward to continuing, and I'm um, uh, pretty honored to have been asked to, to be here with you and to share some of these experiences and also want to give a shout out and a great thanks to our veterans uh, in honor of Veterans Day today and all the men and women out there who have, are, and will be uh, fighting for our freedoms, which is so important. Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you for being here and flying in. But yes, the timing of today's show could not be more serendipitous in terms of getting the word out there about uh, EMDR. And for some of you where it, it seems real confusing, I encourage you to... Uh, go on YouTube or look a little bit deeper for therapists who'd like to get more into the efficacy. Uh, I believe the Amdria Association has uh, presentations on research, which were presented by Ah De Jung at this recent conference. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, thank you for your service to all the veterans out there, including um, my recently passed father, Jacob Olberger. Yeah. Uh, I've always uh, admired those who commit and serve and, um, uh, our guest earlier today, uh, who also uh, served as well, Mr. Nahum Petersile. 
um, and the importance of learning ways to reach veterans that are new and, and the sensitivity um, to, to what you're describing in terms of finding motivation, joining with them, and certainly not alienating them. And the face of veterans is changing. We have younger vets coming home yeah. um, and our abilities to reach them. And they live amongst you. They live near you. And um, it may not be very safe for them to talk about some of the things they've went through. So uh, these are some techniques that may help you uh, and um, have effects on the brain in terms of um, rewiring the brain and how it's activated. And so uh, as a clinician, if you're working with veterans, if you work at the VA, if you work with just a few people that uh, you notice, uh, even seniors in Medicare that they formerly served, this modality could be one that puts in your back pocket and you use, um, and, and you may find some alleviation of symptoms. So I'm excited to be able to uh, share uh, Larissa, with you, I'm um, passionate about introducing people to you who overcome their own burnout, their own um, journey through being a therapist, therapist and continue to grow and expand what they do, their talents, their interests. And we thank all of you for listening. If you have any questions for Larissa, please uh, send us a shout out in the comments on Instagram. Take a listen on Spotify if you want to learn more. Uh, feel free and we'll direct you uh, appropriately. I encourage you to check out Empower TCT. Larissa is always sharing ways in which EMDR is applicable to different populations, whether they be sport and performance uh, or to attachment. Thank you all for listening. Any parting thoughts, Larissa? No, just want to thank you again for this opportunity and um, looking forward to being able to continue to spread these modalities. Amazing. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to our uh, producer, Mr. Albert Jaso, and uh, congratulations to him on all his work and um, journey through pursuing the field of psychology. That's and true. thank you to all our guests and listeners. We look forward to being back here with you, hopefully in two weeks. If you have a guest or a topic we have not covered, please let us know. We are open, interested in expanding, and stay tuned, everybody.